I have here the very first issue of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, and it remains my favorite. Partly, uh, I guess, because I co-authored with Diane Lund and Dolores Jackson the lead article, but also because it contains a remarkable uh, article by Don Bear, Mont Wolf, and Todd Risley. In it, they laid out the uh, dimensions of applied behavior analysis. And I think the most important aspect of the article is that they very precisely identified, as they were at that time, the basic applied behavior analysis uh, research designs. Now, I was really fortunate because I became acquainted with Don Mont and Todd uh, as a student at the University of Washington. Why don't we reminisce a bit? And uh, I think it would be very interesting to know why it was necessary to develop these applied behavior analysis designs, and also maybe a bit about how it happened. I think it was necessary to develop a design because we were proposing to solve some practical problems, <clears throat> and we were going to use techniques that were quite unusual in the field in those days. That meant we would have a very skeptical audience, and we would need to be able to demonstrate to that audience that if we produced an improvement, it was quantitatively verifiable, and that we could assign the change to the techniques we had applied. There would be a great deal of skepticism unless we could produce a proof. Furthermore, I'm not sure that in those days we were all that confident ourselves that what we proposed to do was going to work in every case. We needed to convince ourselves as well as our audience. Mont faced exactly those problems when uh, preschool staff described a child to him with a behavior problem. My first assignment at the University of Washington as the newest and youngest staff member was to work with the preschool teachers, if you'll remember, who had just been incorporated into the uh, child development laboratory. And I was supposed to tell them about um, learning theory and uh, convince them what a nice opportunity they were going to have to do research now with uh, all of us child psychologists. And uh, they were a little skeptical, as they should have been. And um, I was scared to death. Uh, since uh, I didn't really know what to tell them. And uh, so we spent much time arguing and about uh, child raising practices, and they taught me an awful lot about children. And I told them a little about learning theory and uh, some of the basic principles. And then one day they, they came in and told me about um, some of the problems that some of the children were having, and they interpreted these problems for the first time in learning theory terms rather than traditional psychodynamic terms. They described one child, for example, who didn't interact with other children, who spent most of his time in isolation, uh, not playing with uh, the other children. They decided that maybe their technique for working with that child, which had been to try to develop the child's confidence by interacting with that child a lot when he was isolated, might have been actually reinforcing that child for not interacting with other children. And they thought that maybe what they should start doing is paying a lot of attention to the child when he was playing with other children, and maybe ignore him a little bit when he wasn't playing with other children. The experiment began then. They began taking data on his level of interaction. <laughs> After a few days then, they changed how they'd been interacting with him from the comfort, comforting uh, uh, strategy when he was by himself to only attending to him when he was playing with other children or approximately uh, playing, playing with other children. The uh, effect was uh, almost immediate and dramatic. The child uh, went from uh, only um, uh, a few percentage uh, points of play 
We love the children per day, up to more than 50% of his day spent in activities with other children. Uh, the teachers were quite impressed, and so was I, that uh, their differential attention had that kind of effect, seemingly, on the child's behavior. Oh, wow. That's that's a really nice. Great. That's fantastic. The question remained, of course, what was the likelihood of this child learning how to play with children during this time? Just as a function of growing older, getting to know the children better, getting over an illness, a cold, or what have you, uh, rather than the, these new procedures that the teachers were using actually being responsible for this change in his behavior. And this is the question that is at the heart of all experimental designs. What would have happened if, to the child if they hadn't intervened? What would, his, his, what would his behavior have been like if they hadn't changed the way they interacted with him? And of course, uh, that's a question that can never be answered except in approximate ways. And one way of answering that question that the basic researchers in learning theory had told us about was to go back to the original conditions. The, having the teachers interact with the child in the way that they had originally, and then to see if his behavior would go back to the way it had originally been. And that's what the teachers did. The behavior went back to the way it had been, uh, indicating to us that it wouldn't have changed if their behavior hadn't changed. And then they went back to interacting with him uh, only when he was interacting with other children. His behavior, his, his social behavior went up again uh, and uh, convinced us even more strongly that they had been, uh, unbeknownst to them, inadvertently teaching that child to uh, be isolate instead of uh, uh, interacting with other children the way they wanted him to. So that the, this basic experimental design really came from uh, the basic researchers of, that uh, had uh, studied many learning variables before, and we simply adapted it to working with uh, individual children who had uh, uh, specific behavior problems, trying to come up with a way that would allow us to gather data and convince ourselves, and as Don pointed out, our, our critics, potential critics, uh, that the procedures that we employed were responsible for changes and improvements in these children's behaviors. And, and so your preschool studies were among the first in applied settings uh, in which the reversal design was used. Yes. But if we think for a minute, though, about what the options were available to us at that time in terms of a design, here we're faced was faced with a problem with a single child showing a uh, kind of a level of behavior over time and a procedure that may or may not have produced a change in it in that in that level of problem well the uh, alternative strategy that we're most familiar with in child research at that time was to it would have required that you collect a group of those such children showing such behavior problems somehow collect them together or at the same time or in the same measurement conditions and take half of them and apply the procedure to half of them and leave the other half alone and that's a standard group comparison design but you see if with that design you are extremely limited to the kinds of problems you could address yourself to you couldn't have addressed yourself to this problem in an experimental way you could it would have been almost impossible to even answer questions about isolate behavior because you couldn't have found the conditions to get a group of children together and, and uh, look at them all at the same time and randomly assign them to, to groups. But I think, so I think that was what was so unique about what, we, what was going on at that time, is that we were finding the kinds of designs that were appropriate for the problems we were dealing with, rather than only addressing ourselves to problems for which we already had established in traditional designs. Another problem we faced was even if we had shown fairly clearly how that particular child's behavior worked, would that be true for any other children? And our only approach to establishing the generality of the finding was to repeat the study in different children with different behavior problems who were to be handled by different teachers in different classrooms. Uh, the history of the field suggests that that approach worked very often in very much the same way, time after time. No. <clears throat> One thing that that approach doesn't tell us is about the times that the 
there were isolate children who didn't respond to this, to social reinforcement. There were, I'm sure, attempts by teachers to use the same procedures to affect the play behavior of children, and it didn't, didn't work for them. And individual analysis uh, designs do not uh, tell us the probability of these procedures working with uh, individual children as individual cases come along, so that uh, actuarial data are very important and group designs are very useful in providing us with information about uh, uh, the, the likelihood of any given child uh, showing a, a response to these uh, this set of procedures. Uh, in developing procedures, though, where we're usually faced with individual problems of individual kids, we almost always need to use individual subject designs. And it's only later, after we've collected a, a, a number of, of the same kind of problem, that uh, we really care about the actuarial data and the kind of information that we can get uh, from a group design. Well, then you're indicating that the individual designs are supplement or uh, can be used in addition to group designs. Each has its uh, function. Definitely. I, I think individual designs, the way I would characterize them, is more as discovery designs. They're designs which are appropriate and are very compatible mm -hmm. with dealing with problems as you find them without having to establish control or cons uh, comparison groups for m looking at their trend over time and for trying different procedures to affect the, the problem. Mm -hmm. And once you find one, and then you can go on with your reversal design and, and establish causality of that procedure after the fact. Uh, whereas a group design, a good group design, you've already got to pretty well know what's going to happen before you can lay out the group. <laughs> you know, yeah. you marshal your subjects and your procedures in a, in a way to make a clear demonstration. And wh when we talk about uh, uh, individual designs versus this group, that doesn't mean that uh, the reversal design, for instance, can only be applied to a single subject. Would you... Well, an yeah. individual design, I think, is... We're talking about an individual measuring unit. In other words, you, you measure the same person or population repeatedly. And so it can be a whole classroom, the output of a whole classroom of 20 children. But you're simply measuring the same organism or group of organisms all the time and you're not, you don't have a comparison, a second set of, of measures to, for comparison. Yeah, so that the uh, behavior of the group is really the sum of the behaviors of the individuals, and then you treat it as an individual. Like an individual classroom or uh, an individual? Each behavior is at a certain level. Another group of subjects who have undergone experimental treatment and we discover their average behavior is at a different level. In each group, though, there will be some subjects who depart from the mean. In the control group, for example, uh, which has not undergone the experimental treatment, we may find subjects who are quite high, who are nearly at the experimental group's average level. In the experimental group, we may find some subjects who were quite low, nearly at the, exper at the control group's level. We will not be very confident about either of those kinds of subjects. It might be, for example, that a deviant subject in the experimental group who happens to be low is not low because the experimental variable is a failure for him. Perhaps he is low that day because he has a headache, or he's had a fight at home, or his attention is distracted by an itching foot. Uh, there are a thousand events which could have occurred which could give an unrealistic score on that particular occasion for that particular subject. The only way to find out where a subject belongs is to measure him stably, repeatedly, and find out what his typical value is over repeated measurements. But if we do that, we're almost into a single subject design right then and there. Why not collect a baseline, apply an experimental variable, make repeated measurements, discontinue the experimental variable, make repeated measurements, and so on. I think we're better off in the long run if we derive much of our actuarial data from large assemblies of complete single subject designs then if we just not typical of them on that particular day, but we will not know who is typical and who is not on any given day unless we put them into a single subject format. I think that's especially important for applied research because it has... Learn to interact socially, 
um, learn to talk better, learn to read, and so forth, without us ever working on them. <laughs> Quite right. In fact, what our designs are good for is to demonstrate that a certain procedure works so and so often. But it certainly does not demonstrate that other procedures do not work. We need normative data to know what our competition can do. We also need normative data to tell us how far to change some behaviors. As long as we find ourselves able to change the environment sufficiently to produce a behavior change, we also need to know when to stop. When the behavior is normal, according to <clears throat> other children. That might be one goal. It might be a very common goal. Another way of deciding when to stop is to ask the participant or the people who are responsible for the participant what it is that they want done and when it is in fact done. So asking the teacher when the child is uh, attending uh, uh, sufficiently to be uh, uh, considered by her a, a successful student, asking the parent when the child is uh, uh, not tantruming so much that he's disruptive uh, of the rest of the family, uh, and so forth, also gives us some idea about uh, what our consumers desire and when they feel satisfied that we have uh, uh, sufficiently dealt with the problem. I think it's important to remember that our consumers are simply displaying some behavior when they set those norms. We might discover, for example, that some teachers will be very happy with their students if they are quiet, orderly, and polite, and will not be too much concerned with whether they are learning at a faster rate than they used to. Uh, we now have the makings of a behavior analysis of the teacher's norms. We may find that these are her standards. They need not be our standards. They need not be the society's standards. We might now ask, what variables control her choice of what an adequate or a proper outcome is in her class, and how might that be altered? And we might look at other people's, uh, other consumers, uh, and how satisfied they are and how they relate to one another. As you point out, a parent may not be satisfied with the child's performance if it simply means that he's uh, no longer a behavior problem in the class and not learning to read, whereas some teachers might be. And so we are usually dealing with a, a whole range, a, a variety of, of consumers that we need to consider when making decisions about goals and whether or not we've reached the, the goals for the children. Now these, these issues are dealing mostly with where, whether we've produced enough of a change or whether the change we've produced or our, the procedures have produced is in the right direction or on the right behaviors. Uh, in, in terms of the, the initial uh, experimental design issues, however, the, the, we don't usually use those kinds of what you might call consumer ratings as your as a primary datum. That's usually used as a secondary datum to, to uh, because of the problem of reliability of those ratings, whether or not uh, you can get two people to agree whether the child is better or not on, on ratings. It's clear we have a number of consumers for this kind of information, but I think what any consumer should require of us is clear proof of how effective these techniques may be. And that brings us back to design. Let me sketch a few things about the reversal design that we've been talking about. Basically, we're looking at behavior over time. Uh, we measure it perhaps daily, and uh, we find, let's say, that there's not much of it. The daily points come in perhaps like this. We look at that, establish that we have a reliable measurement system operating, find an undesirable level of the behavior, and propose to change it. We apply a technique. We call our baseline A. We'll refer to our technique as B, whatever it may be. It might very well be positive reinforcement. And we look at the continuing daily points <coughs> under this new technique. And perhaps we see something like this. We often have. Now, confronted with that, we can say very clearly, between A and B, we have a behavior change. What we cannot say very clearly is why we have a behavior change. Perhaps this is a developmental trend, which would have occurred anyhow. 
Uh, I remember that preschool teachers often remarked that they thought they had a very healthy environment for children's behavior, and that these sort of shifts from undesirable to desirable levels would probably take place in the natural course of events. Perhaps the event was taking place by itself, and our B was entirely coincidental. So we turn off our B, we revert to the conditions of A, and if the new daily points come in perhaps like this, we have a conclusion, namely, it appears that B is essential. This is not a change that was going to take place anyhow. This is a change which is taking place because of B. In B's absence here and here, the behavior is different than in B's presence. Naturally, we will do it again, partly for credibility and partly because a high level of the behavior is desirable. We will apply B again. We have often seen exactly this pattern when we do so. We have a successful study in the sense of a proof of our point. But one characteristic of this study is that that A condition, that return to the baseline conditions, the stopping of the experimental treatment, the loss of the desirable behavior which we just had and now are going to give away, it seems, can be very expensive to the people who want to conduct the study, to the people involved in it, and to anyone thinking of adopting the same techniques. That can be a very painful experience. Particularly if it's a behavior that's harmful to the child, like, say, self-destructive behavior. It's, um, of course, a behavior that you don't want to reverse. So, so what you're saying is that sometimes uh, people might be reluctant to do a reversal for uh, various reasons. And even though we sometimes still utilize them uh, because it is a very effective research technique, and also because I found it to be a very um, effective training technique uh, that maybe not always uh, are they indicated. Okay, let, let me show you uh, what we usually do <laughs> in that case. While Todd's sketching way up there, uh, aren't there some other reasons why uh, sometimes a reversal isn't appropriate? Yeah, one reason that, that um, we're frequently confronted with is that once you have taught a behavior, once you have modified a behavior, it comes under the control of other naturally occurring reinforcers. And then when you go back to the original condition, the behavior doesn't reverse back. For example, uh, if you teach a child to interact with other children, he may be terribly reinforced by all the attention he gets from the other children. And then when the teacher goes back and starts reinforcing him for isolate behavior, the teacher's reinforcement may not compete effectively with the new reinforcers the child is coming into contact with, and so the behavior may not go back to the way it was originally. Yeah. And isn't that one of the reasons that usually we carry out a reversal very quickly after we've established the behavior? Yes, because we frequently find that repeated reversals uh, after a while, you start failing to get reversal back to baseline behavior because of the natural contingencies taking over. And then what are the alternatives? What? Uh, well, when, when we re would run into these kind of problems, it's ourselves of our, uh, you know, that the procedure had an effect by looking at several behaviors of the child and then operating on one of them and then on the next and on the next and in different times. In this fashion, for example, if we had two behaviors of the child, let's say two kinds of language behaviors, the incidence of, of talking to teachers, the incidence of talking to other children, both of which are low and you want to get this isolate or inarticulate child spending more time talking to other people. And apply a procedure, for example, differential attention and reinforcement for talking at, to uh, the teacher, let's say, at first, and we get a change. Now, if you don't want to reverse that, or you don't think it will, what you would do is simply carry on this measure of the uh, amount of time the child spends, talk, spends talking to other children Un unchanged. The, the behavior to the teacher changes, the behavior to the other teacher does not change. Then you int introduce your differential reinforcement for talking to other children at this point in time, and it begins to change also. So thus we see that at two different points in time we have inserted our same procedure. Uh, it it, it uh, produced a change when and only when that procedure was introduced. Uh, this we called, I think Don coined the term, the multiple baseline design. 
in contrast with the reverse design. Well, in both, you uh, then really the the way you show experimental control is that you get a replication, uh, just a different kind of replication. Yes, that's one aspect of it. Just as you get a replication here and here, you get a replication here and here. But there's something else about these kinds of design. It's not just this replication. It's the time projection of your designs. For example, during baseline, you're not comparing this B with this A condition, really. You're comparing this B level of behavior with what you would have predicted this A to have been. By the trend of this A during your baseline, you would have predicted that it would have gone along at some level like this. And you, would have, you got a difference from that prediction. This A, this return to baseline, kind of verifies that prediction or supports that prediction. And then your second replication here supports it even further, that the B, in fact, produced the change. In this behavior, you have, or in this multiple baseline design, you have the same kind of an effect. You have a prediction from this baseline. You are predicting that this will go along unchanged mm -hmm. if you did nothing. All right? That is supported by the unchanged level of the second behavior. And to the extent that you can assume that if something else were going on, it would have affected the child's probability of talking to children as well as to adults equally, then this constitutes a support of that prediction. Now, the assumption that these two behaviors are similar is further supported when you apply the same procedures to the second behavior, and it changes too. Well. Uh, the multiple baseline design then has some of the aspects of an experimental group control group thing, but it's, uh, it's even stronger because of the replication. It's stronger, right? but it's the real the essence of the comparison is not this baseline with this one. It's this baseline or this behavior with its prediction right. from this baseline. Now, but this simply uh, serves to support that prediction, right. the second baseline. And the third baseline for example, would support a prediction that you made here, if you had another behavior and another, and so on. So those, that, I think, is the essence of the time series design, that when you have the similar considerations of a projection of a trend and a comparison of an actual level behavior with a prediction, prediction made from a trend of data points of measures of the behavior collected over time. You know, Todd, I think the, uh, my second favorite article that's appeared in Jabba, as far as uh, I was, uh, that I was involved in, was the one with uh, Connie Chrysler, uh, Bonnie Tucker, and uh, Sharon Cranston, in which we uh, provided examples of the three basic kinds of uh, uh, multiple baselines. But I think it was you and Don that uh, really first delineated what those were. Could you uh, maybe go into uh, the uh, three basic kinds of uh, multiple baseline design? Well, the, the three basic kinds are... Uh, you ask, what are your dimensions of difference here? For example, with this, we're talking about a single child, perhaps, with two different similar behaviors of a single child. For instance? Uh, for instance, talking to teachers and talking to other children, okay, for a nonverbal child, let's say. Another uh, condition might have been talking to other children under two different conditions, where these are not two different behaviors, in a sense. They're the same behavior, but in outside free play and in indoor music time or something like this, in two different situations. Two different stimulus. Uh, two different stimulus conditions. Right. The other dimension, the third one, might may be, in fact, two different children. Similar children, similarly inarticulate, both appearing going uh, in the same classroom where you measure the behavior of both over time and you apply your procedures to one child and not to the other and then apply them to the other only later. Right. So th those are the three different uh, comparisons that are usual. Uh, they're not the only ones, but they're, right. they're the usual ones, and the ones that are most apparently possible in a multiple baseline design. In other words, uh, one design is multiple baseline across different behaviors of the same subject in the same setting. The second possibility is a multiple baseline of the same behavior across different settings for the same subject. And the third possibility is a multiple baseline across different subjects showing the same behavior in the same setting. You know, Vance, these graphs have a nice symmetry to them. There are as many behavior changes in the reversal design as there are in the multiple baseline design. 
I think uh, that's important for contrasting and comparing the two. But it also points to where each of them has its strength and could have more strength. For example, if we want to build confidence in the apparent conclusion from a reversal design, we simply do it again and again. And if our results come in like this, over and over, we have that much stronger a conclusion. In the same way, in a multiple baseline design, we can gain strength for our conclusion by having many baselines. Perhaps, uh, gloriously, five of them. We apply an experimental technique to the one and watch it change and see no change in the others. We then apply the same technique in the same way to the second baseline and see it change. But if we see no change in the other three, we're now in a position to apply it, that same technique, to the third. If it changes, but the fourth and the fifth do not, we simply follow out the design. And at the end, we have five behavior changes, each perfectly correlated with the application of the experimental treatment and a very convincing design. In deciding on experimental designs <clears throat> and working with children or adult problems, we often don't have the luxury of carrying out designs with that uh, many replications, of course. So we often have to do with less and frequently only very simple uh, ABAB designs and multiple baseline designs like those depicted here can be very convincing. Yeah, so you don't necessarily need that many replications to have a pretty convincing. Uh, but I think, I think that these two, this, this point, I think depicts a kind of a critical point in the logic of these experimental designs. Don has described a replication logic there of saying you do it again and again and again and again. And that replication logic gives you additional confidence, but it's along a particular dimension. Uh, but now for the time series designs, the time series logic simply says that this, you're making a prediction from this particular baseline about this particular behavior change. You're projecting over time and you're you're giving it, getting an estimate from this baseline of where this behavior will be in time, and you're asking, you're making a comparison between this actual behavior change and this prediction for this particular change. And reversing at this point simply gives you a confirmation or support of that prediction. And I would say at this point that this represents a minimally adequate experimental design with a support of this projection over time and a comparison with this actual behavior with that projection. Similarly, I would say at this point that this represents a minimally adequate experimental design of this projection over time, this comparison, this actual behavior in the same situation, let's say, or similarly related to this behavior, going on unchanged. The, with this replication here, to simply tell you that this behavior is changeable, it's susceptible to change, that this would represent a minimally adequate multiple baseline design going on the basis of the time series projections and talking about the actuality of this change and the causal relationship of this particular be variable to this change. The similar to talking about this particular change and the actuality of the B condition variables to this change. Those are two different logics. The difference between them is subtle. I think the replication logic is one postulate more conservative than the time series logic. It doesn't rely upon a prediction of what the behavior would have been. It simply says the behavior now is different than it was previously. Mm -hmm. And then attempts to say why. And it leans upon replication to say why. It's almost in a, in a counterbalanced over time. You have yes. both conditions, both levels of behavior and both over time. Exactly. I wonder if uh, you'd mind commenting just briefly about uh, uh, some of the current dimensions of applied behavior analysis uh, as far as today is concerned. Maybe uh, in what areas they've uh, been used and what are some of the more important uh, uh, contributions really they have uh, uh, re uh, allowed us to uh, 
produce. We've talked about, you know, sim we tended to talk about these as single subject designs, primarily because they were initially used with individual children or individual behaviors of individual children or, or uh, people. Uh, but in fact, they're single group designs. You, you datum can be anything. <laughs> and the same experimental logic applies. You can, for example, people are doing work on speeding, the effects of certain kinds of signs and, and uh, speed traps and so on speeding. And the data points are simply the proportion of cars that pass a certain checkpoint, which are speeding every hour at a certain time of the day. And you, the same logic applies. You can't even identify any, any given individual with those. Uh, many of the things that Mont and Don are doing, you know, and, and I'm doing, uh, you're doing, other people are doing, involve not single children, but whole groups or classrooms or, or groups of, of people interacting in a natural way in some setting. And you measure the average or the overall level of behavior that appears from any member of the group. And you project that group's behavior on it. I think this represents a shift in the definition of response or at least an elaboration in the definition of it. Uh, I think it's been classical textbook behavior to define a response in terms of movements of an organism. Yet I think the practice of this field currently is implicitly to define a response as anything which we can achieve reliable measurement of, which may be the amount of litter left in a campground with right. no way of assigning who left which piece of litter to what human passed through in the last hour. Yet, the outcome of what is clearly human behavior may prove perfectly susceptible to this kind of experimental control and be analyzed thereby. The thrust seems to be against, uh, away from particular, let's say, psychological or theoretical constraints that we have, that were a happenstance in our history, I think, toward a more problem-solving orientation to the field in general. You, you measure, you deal with anything at the level that it's a problem. And, and so this is where the real dimension of the applied comes That's right. in. You know, Vance, to begin with in this field, I think we had a notion of what kind of designs we needed because of the problems that we thought defined the field. But it's come to the point where I think we're getting into the reverse of that relationship. I think these designs are now beginning to define what we mean by applied behavior analysis. Anything we can measure reliably that we can enter into one of those designs and produce an analysis becomes the subject matter of applied behavior analysis and redefines the field. Yes, and even a young discipline. Uh, already, applied behavior analysis has provided tools for parents and teachers and other people in applied settings, which have already been significant and will continue to result in improved educational and uh, other social environmental solutions in a wide variety of uh, settings. 